Hey traders, this is Blake Morrow with Trader Summit. And with me today, I have Mr. Jim Welsh from Macro Tides. Jim, it's great to see you. We uh get to catch up every Friday. And I'm gonna I'm gonna say this. Uh, you've been right. You know, we've got this rally that we've expected out of the markets. We got past the Fed. What are your initial thoughts about the Fed? I mean, you know, I mm. I I heard him say uh, they they're you shouldn't be looking for cuts into you know until yeah. 2020 thousand. <laughs> you know, somewhere but uh well, but the, yeah. the market doesn't seem to care um about that so what are your thoughts do you care about what the uh, fed i care deeply um no you know the last two weeks uh i showed a chart we viewed it uh in terms of what the projections were likely to show and i thought that the fed wouldn't raise the funds rate but that the internal debate that they would have and powell attempting to kind of get a compromise uh, and have it show that there were no dissents. So how do you do that? And I think Powell and probably a lot of the members on the FOMC believe that showing a unified force uh, or presentation uh, is important at this point. So how do you accomplish that? Well, you go with no cut or no hike, pardon me, so the doves are happy. And again, they had legitimate points to make in terms of how much the funds rate has already been increased, the lag time, and so forth. The Hawks also have a legitimate case in terms of, yeah, inflation is coming down on headline because of energy, but core, especially the PCE core, hasn't changed much at all in six months. So how do you accomplish that? Well, I thought that they would raise GDP estimates, which they did from 0.4 to, point, uh, to 1.0. They would increase the funds rate target from 5.1 but they, to, to 5.3, but they went to 5.6. In other words, instead of one hike as I thought was likely, they went to lower the unemployment rate because the economy is not weakening enough and obviously raise the target rate for the funds rate. So to me, that was what they were intending to do. They did it. It came across, in my view, a little bit more forceful. Uh, 12 out of the 18 voters or uh, members uh, are in favor of two hikes. Um, and, and as Powell said, no one uh, even the most dovish member, which my guess is Goolsby, um, is in favor of cutting rates. So to your point, you know, they, they again, whether the market listens or not, I mean, let's remember this. This is important because I kept hearing on CNBC the last two days, oh, the Fed's lost credibility. Well, wait a second. When does the market lose credibility? Five weeks ago, the market, in all of its wisdom, said the Fed was going to start cutting the funds rate in July, then in August, then in September. There was going to be two cuts. Well, they were totally wrong. And now, you know, they think, now nah, the Fed may go one more, but they're not going two. So my point, the faith that people have in markets, to me, is misplaced a lot of the time. And yet, instead, we turn the tables and say, well... Uh, the FMC's lost credibility because the markets don't believe it. Well, it's a bunch of people have been wrong more often than not the last 14 wrongs months. So why hasn't their credibility been dented? No well, one ever asked that question. <laughs> What's interesting, Jim, is, um, you know, I, 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 I'm uh, uh, old school learning, if you will. And, uh, and I've been through a few bear markets. And, um, you know, one of the things that I've learned over the years is, is bear market rallies, such as the one that we're in right now, which I think we're in right now, is very they're they're very convincing, and um, yeah. and it and it gets everybody bullish. And uh, right now, it seems like everybody is well, you know, most people are bullish. They're looking yes. past like there's going to be no recession, and um, you know, could this be a trap? It's a trap, you know. Uh, well, going back that, to the old Star know, Wars uh, an analogy. Yeah, as you know, that's my view because a year ago, remember, at this time. Uh, and especially over the summer, you know, people were looking for a recession because we had two quarters in a row of negative GDP. And then when new orders in the ISM uh, uh, numbers turned negative in October of last year, oh, that's more confident. We're already in this recession. It's going to start. So my point is what we have is the majority of people were wrong about the idea there was a recession in last year or would be one early this year. And now those folks because they've been so wrong for so long, other than David Rosenberg, he's going to be to his death. He's going to be saying we're already in a recession <laughs> and no offense, David, but come on. Um, but, you know, my point is, you know, 
I didn't think it was a recession last year. I thought the first half of this year was going to be okay. That really is in the second half of this year that we're going to see slowing. So it's ironic to me that people now have kind of tossed the idea of recession out the window. And one of the things they pointed to uh, is the strong jobs report. And as you and I have discussed the last couple of weeks, if you look at hours worked, they're, they've dropped significantly. Well, employers only do that as if, you know, A, they don't want to lay people off, but they cut back on hours because they want to uh, pair labor costs. Um, but that has to mean that the economy is starting to soften in a lot of these people's views. Temporary jobs have been contracting for six months. These are the things that happen before the labor market starts to weaken. So to me, it's doubly ironic that a lot of the people who thought we were in a recession last year and ignored and made fun of the strong jobs report last year have now done a 180 and said, well, look, we're not in a recession and uh, the jobs report proves it. It's just classic stuff. Um, but And as we've talked uh, a lot, you know, my second half softening call is based on leading economic indicators lead time of about 10 months, which says, okay, sometime around September, um, inverted yield curve, which is in the fourth quarter, and tighter lending standards all suggest that as we get near the end of the third quarter, um, I think the idea of more weakness is going to become pronounced. So we'll see. So the predication of this rally and that we're in a new bull market, well, it's up over 20%, kind of ironic. Barron's last week, the cover in Barron's, and I highlighted this in my Monday macro tides. You know, whenever a financial publication has a, a cover, it typically only happens after a market's been trending for a long time and everybody's kind of on board. Sure. Right? The last time they had a cover was October 10th of last year, and it was the dollar. It was super strong. You and I were talking, and I'm saying, hey, I think the dollar is getting ready to pull back. The date of the cover, the dollar was over 113. I thought the dollar was set to pull back to 105. It did. It went to 101 by February. So these are the signs that contrarians start to look at and say, okay, a lot of people are getting pretty excited here. It's time to become more cautious. And I, for me, um, I think the idea that the economy uh, isn't going to have a recession when reliable indicators are suggesting otherwise, um, you know, provide some, uh, you know, legitimacy to being a contrarian. You know, being a contrarian for contrarian's sake doesn't work. You need actual, you know, right. substance to back it up. You know, uh, you know, you can be a teenager and be a contrarian. I mean, that's the definition of being a teenager, right? So. <laughs> <laughs> well, and you know right, that well, you have teenagers. I do. So I do. You're I do. living uh, it, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's let's jump into let's jump into okay. uh, you know um, what what the charts that you brought today. Okay. Yeah. And, and the first one uh, that you brought is going to be uh, CPI. Yeah. And um, you know we got CPI this week. Uh, we got the Fed. We got other central banks. But yeah. CPI, this is a big deal to not only. Uh, you and I here, but uh, the markets just in general uh, to the to the uh, the real world. Um, so, what are you yeah. seeing here? Well, obviously, you can see headline inflation has dropped from around nine percent to four. It's a big decline. Again, just like the upside was driven by energy, the downside has been driven by energy. My point is, I've been writing about this particular month and specifically this week that we were going to see a pretty big decline in headline inflation. Because And we showed a table last week, I believe, that the takeaway value was 97 basis points, so that if inflation went up three-tenths, we were going to see the CPI drop from 4.9 to either 4.2 or 4.3. It got down to 4. Conversely, I didn't think the core would drop as much in the month of May. It didn't. My expectation was that it would be 5.3, and it was 5.3. And this is what the Fed is looking at, Blake, is more core rates of inflation and the CPI isn't at the top of the list of their inflation metrics that they pay attention to. It's the Personal Consumption Expenditure Index, which is the PCE. Uh, a couple of the other feds have different metrics. So my point is that I expected these numbers to come in positive. I expected the stock market to rally and anticipate that the Fed would have justification of being less hawkish. And then what the next 
chart or the yeah, thing that uh, we're going to look at is my expectation for what the Fed was likely to do. And that was, as we talked really the last two Fridays, that they were going to raise the guesstimate for GDP, bring down the uh, unemployment rate, and increase the inflation. You can see from 3.6 on the core to 3.9, which is the number they pay more attention to. And then the Fed funds, I thought, was going to tick higher. So to me, the Fed did everything I thought it would do. And then it was just a question of whether, as I referenced, I think that the teenagers in the stock market would actually pay attention to any of this stuff. And they did for about, I don't know, 45 minutes or so, or whatever <laughs> it was, right? Um, and there's reasons why I think, the, uh, you know, this uh, statement by the Fed was kind of ignored. Um, but the fact that so many of the members of the FOMC uh, have the view that they need to raise rates more, um, I think should be respected. For the last 14 months, the Fed has been unreasonably clear on, on you know, um, uh, unbelievably clear in terms of what they're going to do. And then they've done it. And consistently, Wall Street has doubted that they were going to do it. And then, oh, yeah, I guess they will, you know. So, uh, again, I think the Fed is going to follow through. They are meeting by meeting. And clearly, they need to see core inflation come down. The other point I'm going to make is if you listen and read what Powell said in his press conference, Blake, and this is just not this last one. This is going back many months. The real focus for the Fed now isn't the inflation numbers as much as it is the labor market. Because the one area that he keeps talking about that is important from inflation standpoint and really getting it down to the number that they want, the 2% number, is ex-housing services. And he has consistently said the key determinant of that is labor costs. And what we're seeing is unit labor costs continue to be ramping higher. Productivity has been negative. So that's the number, I think. But the Fed... And Powell can't come out and say, you know, look at the unemployment rate that they have for the end of this year and next year, 4.5. Getting to 4.1, we'll, we, we will be in a recession. Historically, whenever the uh, unemployment rate has gone up by 0.5% from a low, so the low is 3, 4, 3, 5, you've been in a recession and then it keeps going up. 4, 5 guarantees you a recession. So everybody's saying, why is the Fed doing this? Because it raised the GDP you know, again, they believe they need to see labor market tightness ease significantly, and it will be reflected in the unemployment rate. So, do you, do you think do you think from here? And and I know I know your next uh, your next uh, uh, image is going to be your outlook. So, yeah. um, and by the way, if you you guys and gals are listening to this and you're learning a lot from Mr. Welsh, make sure you give him a big thumbs up. Subscribe to this channel so you don't miss these these uh, interviews each and every week. Um, but Jim, do you do you feel that the Fed still has room to go? Do you? I mean, I know it's a big debate right now. Yeah. On on if if they will, because um, I think uh, you know just you know my my point of view is that the fed is getting us to where they feel is neutral and they can still ramp up from here if they yeah. need to do you, do you believe that that is the the case yeah, yeah i do um okay. again they want to see the economy slow materially now paula said yeah we're growing below trend trend is about 1.9 so obviously gdp is under 1.9 that was one of the prerequisites that he's talked about the key is the labor market they want to see the labor market ease because in terms of getting a long standing uh, relief uh, of inflationary pressures, um, you know, publicly, you don't want to say, yeah, we really need to, you know, have one and a half million people lose their jobs. So the unemployment rate goes from three, five to four, five. Um, you can't say that publicly. Sure. Uh, but that's kind of what's going on behind the scenes and what's implied by the numbers that they're producing. So again, they're in this tough area where they want to keep nudging the funds rate up to get it to a modestly restrictive level without aggressively tipping the economy into a recession because then they're going to have to reverse policy. So they're trying to thread the needle, which is awfully difficult, especially in a post-pandemic environment where so many of the economic dynamics have been unique. Yeah. So it's not easy what they're attempting to do. Uh, I mean, clearly they blew it in 2021 in terms of inflation being transitory. But I think, you know, one has to accept that this is a very difficult environment for them to be operating in. Um, but 
Um, again, my, my conclusion is that they're going to continue to nudge the funds rate higher until they see more progress. The other thing I'll point out, with the stock market rallying, bond yields have come off the highs. The dollar is, you know, hanging around not, you know, it's two percent or so from the lows. Um, credit spreads between treasuries and uh, junk bonds and such have narrowed. Why? Because people don't think we're going to have a recession. So my point is, the market-based financial conditions have eased pretty significantly, and and that's going to feed that, that's going to feed into the inflation loop, right? Well, it, it speeds into more spending. Yeah, right. You know. I mean, housing had an adjustment. Well, now it's bottoming. So, it's, but yeah, and he, he even referenced housing uh, in in yes. his in his uh, conference that he's keeping yeah. an eye on, and he's seen prices rise in uh, and 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 stabilize in a lot of markets. So, right, right. So again, um, I, I just think that uh, the idea that the economy isn't going to experience a pretty sharp slowdown after the monetary tightening that's taken place. I just I don't know how that can be, you know, quite honestly. The lag time is the the issue. And, you know, I've looked at excess savings and a lot of other things that have buttressed consumers' income and therefore their spending. But as we get close, as we go past mid-year, more of those savings are going to be spent down. And I think uh, there's two surveys that came out this last week, which I will discuss in, you know, soon publications that show that consumers have, they were asked, have you cut back or are planning to cut back spending on leisure and entertainment, uh, going out to dinner, you know, that kind of stuff? And the percentages uh, were like in the low 40s and now they're the upper. So they've all gone up about 10 percent. It's not mm. huge, but yeah. it incrementally you know, supports the idea that, you know what, slowly but surely, consumers are likely to pull back. Whatever their motivations, either because of high prices or savings getting run down or they've satisfied the urge to, you know, go out and do stuff and take trips after being shut down. Um, you know, so again, I think that's what the stock market is missing. It's ironic that they're doing so, I think, right before it's like Wiley Coyote. You know, I think that the we're getting closer to the point where Wiley's just moving off the edge of the cliff. And, and you know, that's maybe a little bit dramatic. But again, I just think the second half of this year is going to show more signs of slowing. All right. Well, let's uh, go into your outlook and what 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 yeah. is what is this uh, uh, image about? Well, this is just basically kind of recapping some of the things we've talked about. That from the jobs report being decent, debt ceiling. These were things that were really worrying people. And once that hurdles were passed, it's like, oh, now we don't have to worry about a recession. We've got inflation falling. Oh, definitely confirmed by the CPI, the PPI reports. People still think earnings are going to be up 11%. Eh, they may raise one more time or so. It's no big deal what the FOMC is doing. So those are the reasons why people, I think, have become more bullish. Um, and then technically, as you know, for a few weeks there when the S&P was hovering under 4,200, I thought we're, the, the debt ceiling is going to get solved and we're going above 4,200. You had a lot of people that had put on uh, hedges because of the debt ceiling risk and so forth. Well, as you get above 4,200, those hedges get covered. That adds to some buying. Artificial intelligence, it's kind of become a little bit of a craze. You know, will it help uh, uh, productivity and be a net positive for the economy? Yeah, we're talking over maybe five years, not next quarter. You know, so things have gotten a little crazy there. And of course, it's concentrated in some of the big tech stocks. But the idea that no recession is coming, oh, kind of buy the cyclical stocks. So we've seen industrial, basic materials, small cap stocks. The other thing is, well, the stuff that's really down, I don't want to chase that artificial intelligence tech stock stuff. But if we're not having a recession, hey, I better buy the, the cyclical stuff. So breath has improved modestly, but that's the rationale. Um, the other thing is just the technical aspect uh, that happens in this is the quad witching expiration. Every three months, you get the expiration of futures, options on futures, options on stocks. It's like the whole enchilada, right? Well, what happens is when somebody buys a call option, dealers then are short. They're the ones who sold the call to the buyer. We've seen a big pickup in call buying, right? 
Well, as the market goes up, the dealers then are kind of forced to cover because the call they sold was at five. Now it's at six. Now it's at seven. They then have to implement strategies to neutralize um, and contain the losses. That adds to buying in the short term. So as the S&Ps transversed 4350 and all the strike prices to 4400 and above, it's unleashed this dynamic, time compressed. Then on top of it, you know, months ago, we were looking at charts that showed over 40% of all the option activity is 24-hour options. You know, so what that does is just amplify interday moves, whether they be up or down, you know. And so to me, a lot of things have come together the last two, three days and why the market shrugged off the Fed uh, statement and all the rest of that is some of it is just this mechanical stuff that came into play as the S&P got above 4350. And then it launches these um, buying uh, that has to happen as you get above 4350, then you get above 4360 and so forth, right? Yeah. So I think the options expiration played a role. And then what comes next? As I've been saying, I think the economy is going to slow down a lot. The, technically, what normally would happen is you had a breakout above 4,200. It would be very normal for the market to pull back to that breakout level. Even if I was bullish and thinking the economy is going to be doing gangbusters and just fine, I would expect to pull back towards the 4,200, 4,230 level as like a, hey, let's check back to that breakout. Right. If if the S&P gets below 4,200, then that opens the door, I think, to the next uh, horizontal support, which is the 39, 39, 50. So that's my outlook. I, I think between now and the end of the quarter, Blake, you've got end of quarter wind dressing. Well, our big institution is going to want to show that they're going into uh, cyclical stocks uh, more than they have. Probably. If you think the economy is going to be just fine, you're going to want to show the people who have money invested with you that you're smart enough to anticipate that and put some you know, cyclical stocks in. The Russell has a rebalancing every June. So to me, these are some of the things that can help the market levitate over the next couple of weeks um, and not have, you know, uh, you know, why is selling pressure going to pick up? I, I don't think I see that in the immediate future. Um, it really comes as we get beyond mid-year that I think there's going to be economic data that does uh, generate an increase in selling pressure. So I think, you know, we got this spike up here. I think there's a period of time where you could see some choppiness before selling pressure picks up. Okay. Trend line, you can see the high back in February, 40 or December, pardon me, uh, uh, 4101 and 4195 in February. And that trend line, I think, is around 43, 60, 80, 90, whatever it is. Um, it's up there. So the first sign would be have it break down below that upper trend line, kind of like as a false breakout of that trend line. Um, and, and so to me, that's my expectation is we're likely to see that happen at least in, in the next week or so. And then, you know, I think what follows next is that retest of the 4,200 level. The call put ratio at the bottom. Um, you can see people buying calls like crazy. So that's why what I was discussing earlier about what happens when somebody buys call options, the dealers are the guys who sell that to them. Now they're short. Well, they got to do something when the market breaks above strike prices. That's added to what we've seen. So, um, you know, all these sentiment surveys uh, are really, really showing a lot of bullishness. But that alone doesn't get the market decline. You've got to have a reason to sell before institutions are going to sell. And, you know, right now they think everything is copacetic. Something has to change that. My view is that as we get past mid-year, you know, uh, the economy is going to give them a, a reason to do some selling, but, you know, not tomorrow, obviously. Got it. Well, the dollar, the dollar took a, a bit of a tumble. Um, it dropped a little bit more than I thought it was going to drop. So what's your yeah. outlook here? Well, in the Monday weekly technical review, my expectation was that we were going to see a nice drop in the CPI, which would change perceptions of what the Fed was going to do on Wednesday, and we would see uh, the dollar weaken a little bit. Then yesterday, the ECB came out, not only with a rate hike, but Lagarde was, I'd say, more verbally hawkish than people expected. So the euro got a bounce. 
I think the dollar has completed this the pullback after the recent move up. And I still think the odds are we're going to see the dollar a rally above the high we saw two weeks ago. And ultimately, I think, make a move back up to that 105.88. You know, the markets don't believe the Fed, that the Fed is going to do what they're saying they're planning to do. And I think as that becomes apparent, Blake, that should be a tailwind for the dollar. Okay. Uh, yeah, we'll we'll see. I mean, because we yeah. are currently, you know, making, we made a lower high here uh, technically. Yes. So I'm wondering, will we, will that, you know, cause a, an eventual breakdown lower low? It, hey, obviously that's certainly possible. Yeah. Um, okay. You know, I mean, you got to acknowledge it. I still think, as I've been saying, I think that low back in January, the rally off that was wave A, the pullback was B. I think, you know, we're in wave C and that suggests a rally back up above wave A. But you're 100% right. You get below that, you know, the low was, I think, 100.79. So uh, to me, you get much below 101.50 and that would really start to cast doubt about, you know, that outlook. I don't think you have to wait, is my point, Blake, for the dollar to go down and make a new low. I yeah. think, you know, the retracement starts to become a little bit untenable um, if the dollar gets below 101.50. And th always this is cash, not futures. Makes sense. All right. Well, we have uh, we have this gold um, move. And I, I was I was pretty confident we were going to break out uh, this week and uh, we didn't. So, yeah. <laughs> well, what's interesting is the the gold overnight. I can't remember if it was Wednesday, Tuesday night or Wednesday night. It actually took out the, the low at 1938. I think it got to 1934 on the cash and then zipped that back up. I still think potentially gold's going to rally above 18, uh, pardon me, uh, uh, was it uh, 1983? So I, that number up there is wrong. 1983, not 1883. Okay, 1983. So in other words, it. the bounce off that low at A. So gold dropped 121 bucks from to, uh, 2059 uh, to uh 1938 uh it bounced to 1983 we pulled back uh took out that 1938 and then reversed i think that it's going to rally above 1983 and then i think you got another let down below the interday low we saw overnight a couple days ago the six uh, the 382 of that whole move up from last september to the high gets you around 1890 so to me we've had one part of the correction now we're doing the middle part, and then I think there's another drop coming to finish wave two. And as we've been saying for weeks, the outlook is that that rally from September to the high in May is wave one of a rally that will take gold to new all-time highs. So it was just a question of how deep is wave two going to be? Wave one lasted 30 weeks. So to me, eight to 12 weeks seems just a reasonable time amount to retrace of that 30 weeks and that would get us late july maybe august you know early august time frame um so i just think gold is going to do a fair amount of meandering but i do believe we've got wave c down that's going to take out 1933 maybe approach the 1890 before this correction is done all right. Well, um in the bond market you you you've been looking for a rally in the bond market we've seen Yields have still been uh, really, you know, quite strong. Now we pull, we've seen yeah. a little bit of pullback the last couple of days. So is that is that the start of something here uh, in the bottom? Well, you know, I, I still am waiting for one more dip below that 100.03 on TLT. In other words, bond prices backing off a little bit. Um, and for the last two weeks, I'm saying, okay, buy TLT at 99.20. It just hasn't happened. So I think again, my take is that there's a little bit more weakness to be seen again as the market starts to take in that oh, maybe the fed's really serious um maybe the employment report that comes out in july uh remember the unemployment rate went from three four to three seven but a big part of that blake was a three hundred and ten thousand self-employed people say i'm not employed so that hit hit the household survey which is where the unemployment rate is calculated from so my point is I think that pop isn't real. <laughs> okay. So that I think there's a chance you're going to see the unemployment rate tick down from three seven 
probably to at least three six with an outside chance of three five. That wow. might be enough to get the one more leg down or pullback in the bond market. Uh, and then again, as we get past mid year, we're going to see more signs of slowing. I think the bond market is going to like that. Um, I think the amount of treasury paper that the uh, treasury is going to be issued to rebuild its general account, most of it is in T-bills. So I don't think that'll have a huge impact on treasury bonds. And what we've seen so far is money is coming from other money sources. In other words, it isn't draining as much liquidity as people thought. And that's been my view. Is it a negative? Yeah, because uh, for you know months the treasury couldn't issue any bonds. Well, you know the lack of supply is supportive. Um, so uh, I I do think that that's a modest negative and one more reason why we could see uh, bond yields tick a little bit higher before the economic news starts to really bear on um, the outlook for bond Interesting. yields. Interesting, and then then, the, then bonds will catch a bit after that. All right, Jim. Well, they you know tailwind. Yeah, it would be a tailwind. Yeah. Um, well, you know, it's been a real busy week. What are we looking ahead towards, uh, uh, you know, the rest of the month as we head into, uh, you know, get into uh, the re remainder of June? Yeah. Well, as I said, in the equity market, I think you've got factors that are likely to be supportive. Uh, you know, window dressing going into the quarter, the Russell rebalance, um, you know, data points. You know, I'm not sure there's not a ton of data. Maybe there's a PCE that comes out the last few days of June, which will be watched uh, closely. Um, I just think that, to your point, a lot of news has happened. We've seen a little burst of volatility. My expectation would be things are probably going to come down a little bit, um, you know, because we've gotten a lot of things behind us. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, the, well, well, next week it's going to be uh, rather interesting. So, uh, Jim, I, I want to say thank you so much for joining us today. And thanks for always being here. Tell tell us how we can follow your work uh, over at Macrotides. Uh, Macrotides.com. Write me an email, Jim Welsh, uh, macro at Gmail. I'll send you a recent publication. The one thing I, I noted in Monday's report, uh, Blake, is, and again, the, the dot plots that the Fed provided, we're going to see... FOMC members talk the game in coming as they give speeches. In other words, yeah, I was in even the most dovish ones are likely to say, yeah, I thought it was appropriate that we not raise at the June meeting, but uh, I'm open to us raising rates um, in coming, you know, months if if it's necessary, if inflation doesn't drop as, you know. So I just think the tone is going to be pretty uniformly hawkish from all these FOMC members. Um, in a sense, it's a form of jawboning and the market is gonna have to deal with that. And that's another reason why I, I think the upside is capped, but I think there's reasons why, you know, expecting a large decline in equities between now and the end of the month is doesn't seem realistic either. Yeah, okay, well, you know, upside might be capped, but uh, downside you should probably end up finding some buyers at least ahead of 4,200. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Yep. Yeah, you might guess. All right. All thanks right. as always. Enjoy the three day weekend. To the thanks. Yeah. Uh, Juneteenth, uh, new, uh, one of the newer holidays here in the United States on Monday. So have a great Juneteenth. And uh, thanks, Jim. We will catch you next week. Thanks so much, Blake. Hey, traders. Blake Morrow here. Thanks for stopping by our YouTube channel. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe to our channel. Also, click the bell notifications so you do not miss any of our market related trading analysis from some of the leading industry experts. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see you in the next video.